Adriana. I'm an environmental engineer and I have a master's in sustainability analysis, but most of my work experience, at least my past work experience, was focused on the building industry and sustainable building. So that's why today I make a presentation on net zero water buildings, which is a very interesting and relatively new topic. You probably have heard already this word net zero. It's definitely one of the current buzzwords, but you heard it paired with energy and carbon, not that much with water. So that's when I want, I want to explore a bit more this concept of net zero water buildings. What are they, how they work and what it could be a solution for water scarcity. So just want to start by giving you an overview of the problem of using water in the construction industry. So over its entire life cycle, uh, which means from mining and manufacturing construction materials up to decommissioning a building, the construction industry used something close to 30% of the potable water available in the world. And it also produced around to 30% of the total global wastewater. So it's a very, very water intensive industry. And if you look at the right side of this slide, you can see some uh, examples of where water is uh, used in the construction process. So uh, we have there a chart that shows us how much water is embodied into the construction materials. So we still aluminum and aggregate. It's uh, are some of the most uh, water intensive materials that has that they use most of the water during its manufacturing process. But we also need to use water in the construction site itself. So, you know, we need to use water to cool the construction machines uh, and we pump and drain water all over the construction sites. And of course, we need to use water when building is operating, when it already is, the building is done and people it's occupying the building. So then we're going to need to open our showers, flush toilets and, of course, irrigate our landscaping. So... 1.65 billion liters of water. It's the amount of water that we use in Australia just for households. It's not taking in account the amount of water that we use in commercial buildings. So in our shopping centers, in our schools, none of the commercial buildings. We are just talking about households. So you can have an idea of how much water we are actually using for the building environment and why this is an important matter for the building industry. All right, so net zero water uh, came up as an approach to actually try to tackle this issue. So the net zero water, it's a concept, as I said, a relative new concept. And I want to explore a bit more what it is about and if you actually have any net zero water buildings that are fully operating, if it is achievable and uh, how they actually work, what's involved in getting a net zero water building. So let's just start by understanding a bit more of the concept. So the concept of net zero water building means that we have a building that can completely offset its operational water use with alternative water and by returning water back to the original catchment area. So I uh, just want to highlight that I said offsetting operational water use because this is how we have been actually working, but it, nothing we, we could do a building that offsets its entire its entire life cycle of water use. So from the sourcing materials up to the commission, but it would be a much, a very much more complicated uh, situation. So I'm trying to work, work with the most simple situation here, just to give you an understanding of the building. So let's say they're trying to, to offset the operational use and uh, alternative water and return water, it's an, uh, another concept that I want to explore a bit more, just to make sure that we can understand what is the net zero building. So uh, alternative water, if you're not familiar with this term, means that it's water that's not derived from freshwater source. So it could be, for example, seawater, storm water, treated waste or rainwater, which is probably the most common alternative water source. And returned water, which means the water that goes back to the catchment area, it's all the water that is collected from the building system and goes back to the catchment or uh, the, the, the basin where the, came, where, the, where the water came from originally. So this is done through green infrastructure, usually your garden. So uh, this is the easiest way of sending back water to uh, the catchment because the water will penetrate into the soil, then fill up all the water table and fill up the aquifer. And then at some point you flow up to the rivers. 
And finally, the total water use, which is all the water consumed in a building includes potable and non-potable water source. So it means alternative water source plus uh, the town water supply, for example, which is a potable water source. I show you some examples um, in the practice, like I, I spoke about the theory behind this concept, but I think that it's easy to understand by looking at an example, a real, uh, an, a, a, at least a draft of a real example. So I just get this a pen here because I think that it's easy if I can uh, do this together with you guys. So as I said before, the net zero, it's a building that can offset its operational use by using alternative water and uh, returning water back to the catchment. So let's say that this building here is supposed to be a net zero building. So you can we can see that it is using alternative water from rain and from reuse. So let's say that it's using, I don't know, like five liters of alternative water. Okay, so I put here five liters. But this same building is also using some fresh water. And it does because in many places, we actually need to use potable water from the town water supply to fill up our taps, especially kitchen and bathroom taps and shower, which we call potable water and uses. So let's say that this building is uh, using five liters from the town water supply. Okay, so in this case, we are having a total water use of 10 liters, right? So we have five from non-potable, five from potable. This takes us to 10 liters of total water use. And to get this uh, net zero situation, this means that you're gonna need to hit return another five liters, right? Otherwise this wouldn't be true. So if you check here on the amount of water that we're sending back to the catchment through our green infrastructure, it, then in this situation here, we need to send back five liters. So this is how it works in this very, very simplified way. And another, easier way to, to think about it is that every time that we use uh, water from potable water source, we need to offset that the same amount by sending it back to the catchment. This is another way of thinking about how net zero water um, building works. I'll give you another example here. This example is um, a building that I got from the an American en Energy Department. And it's a, probably clo closer to the reality of a net zero water building. So here again, we can see that this building is using 15 liters from the town water supply. You can follow the light blue arrows and see that we are sending this potable water to the potable water and uses, which are taps and showers. But this building is also using another 10 liters that comes from the non-potable water tank. And if you follow the dark blue arrows, you see that non-potable water is going up to the flushing systems. So in total, we have here 10 liters of alternative water source, alternative water, sorry, that is coming from the non-potable water tank and another 15 coming from the town water supply. So this gives us a total of 25 liters. So to get this uh, working, we are gonna need to send it back another 15 liters back to uh, the catchment or and as I said before, you can think that you're gonna to need to offset 15 liters because that's the amount of water that we are getting from uh, the town water supply. That's the amount of potable water that we're using. So if you check here on the dark uh, green arrows on green infrastructure, you're gonna see that's exactly the right amount of water that we're sending back to the groundwater. So this is how the building uh, normally operates, a uh, uh, net zero water building would normally operate. And just for curiosity, if you check back, uh, track back these arrows that are feeding the non-potable water tank, you're gonna see that the, the green, the light green arrows are coming from the rooftop. So this is uh, the rainwater. We are catching five liters from the rooftop and the gray arrows lead us back to the, gray wastewater discharge, which comes from the shower drains and taps. In case we're not familiar with the, con the concept of gray water, black water, just letting you know, gray water, it's a type of sewage 
that it's not as pollutant as the black water that comes out of your toilet. So we say that they, they have a, a much lower concentration of a pollutants, especially biolog biological ones. So they can be treated differently. We can do, we use them different. So that's why we, ideally we should be collecting them differently. But you can treat your black water on site. At least in many places you are allowed to do that. We can treat black water back up to potable water standards if you want to. That's exactly what a, a wastewater plant do, does. So just this is an example of a simple uh, uh, net zero water building. Treating black water on site, it's a bit more complicated, but it's something feasible. There are examples of buildings that actually do that. And just trying actually to summarize how we can achieve a net zero water building. I, build this roadmap, which I think that uh, it's a very easy way to understanding how we can achieve that. So the first step involved in designing a net zero water building is to estimate. So we need to estimate how much water we're gonna use. We need to estimate what's the size of our roof area to know how much rainwater we can catch, or we need to estimate our uh, stormwater systems to know how much stormwater we can catch and harvest. So the first thing is to estimate. And this is why we need to incorporate the net zero uh, approach since the very first beginning of the design stage. It's really hard and costly to incorporate this idea later on the project because we we're gonna need to go back to the estimations and probably change all this, the plans and designs. So once we know this and have estimated the amount of water correctly, we can um, go to the next step, which is to reduce the water that we use on site. And we can do that by choosing more efficient appliances and more efficient uh, fixtures. So for example, the dual flush toilets, the six star taps on our kitchens, you know, the wells rating system that we use in Australia to rate uh, the efficiency, the water efficiency of a fixture. So we can choose the most efficient ones by ch checking that label, but we can also do other things like for example, uh, replacing cooling systems that use water by those, uh, uh, options that don't actually need to use water, especially in office buildings and shopping centers. Most of the cooling systems actually require a large amount of water to operate. And another example of how we can reduce the amount of water is, for example, using putting a cover in our pools. So uh, if we if we have a cover in pools and spa, we don't lose much water through the evapotranspiration. So this is a very easy way of actually reducing the amount of water that we are wasting. And the third step is to harvest. So we need to have alternative water to offset our operational use, right? And it can be from uh, rainwater, storm water. Probably the most common one is harvesting rainwater from your roof. It's the most simple way of doing this. And this is the example that I'm actually showing here. The fourth step is to treat the water that we are uh, harvesting. Uh, just, this is uh, probably something that you uh, don't actually need to actively do because most of those storage tanks already have a filter inside. So they kind of have a um, treating system inside them. Uh, but just let you know that this is something that we can uh, work on later, depending on how you wanna use this harvested water. If you wanna just use that for non-potable end use, so you don't need to uh, think too much about the treatment, especially if you have a good storage uh, water storage tank. And then the fifth step is to actually reuse the alternative water that we have harvested. So you can send that water back to the non-potable end uses, which are, for example, the laundry machine, the washing machine of your house, and the um, landscape, the irrigation system of your landscape. But as I said before, if you are treating water on site up to potable water stands, standards, then you can reuse that water to drink. You can you can drink the water that you are treating. But this is very complicated in terms of legislation. For most places, you are not allowed to do that if you have access to the town water supply. The only situation where you can actually treat water inside up to pot potable water standards is when you cannot access the town water supply. So if you are in a remote area, for example. And this is complicated because, you know, Potable water, it's a public health 
uh, matter. So, you know, the legislation, uh, the, the regulation agencies, they are concerned with the fact that people will not have the technical capacity to monitor, sample, and test the water that they're actually treating, and they could drink something that is not uh, potable and get sick. And the final step before sending it back to the groundwater is to treat uh, your wastewater. So, you can get in this case here where you're using rainwater to uh, our washing uh, washing machines, for example, the treatment can be very, something very simple that involves filtering the water that comes out from the gray uh, water discharge. So we can use like a natural treatment system as for example, a rain gutter, and then send it back to the recharge, which is just letting go through the soil and penetrate back into the water table. And these are some of the examples that buildings that operate on a net zero water logic. We have more in the world, but not many, to be honest, because as I said before, it's a relative new concept and it's not as popular as net zero or any, uh, net, a net zero energy or net zero carbon. But yes, we have some people that are trying to achieve the net zero water idea. And these are some of the examples that I've selected to show you guys. So we have some uh, buildings in America. So we have uh, a building in Australia, which is from the University of Bologong. And I have here an example from Brazil. So these buildings operate, all of them operate in a net zero water building, but some of them uh, work a bit different. So this one here, for example, the Bay Foundation, they treat all the water that they need on site, which means that they're actually sourcing potable water from uh, alternative water source and treating on site up to potable water standards. And you can see that we have these labels on top of the pictures, which um, the lead zero label, the green star and the living building challenge. Uh, just to let you know, these are some of the sustainable building rating systems that we have available. There are a lot of uh, sustainable building awards and ratings available today in the market. And these three are some of them that uh, award those buildings that can achieve a net zero water uh, situation. So those examples here have been awarded with LEED or the Living Building Challenge or Green Star. Probably you've heard about the green star because they are very, it's very popular in Australia, while lead is more popular in America. And Living Building Challenge as well is definitely the most innovative and ambitious um, rating system in terms of sustainability. And I think it's nowadays getting popular worldwide, but it's still more popular in America. And finally, want to uh, talk about the challenges involved in this process of getting a net zero water building. So the first issue here is the definition. Uh, we have a lack of consensus around uh, the meaning of the term net zero water. Differently from a uh, net zero energy, the net zero water uh, concept is slightly, uh, it, it would, I would say that it's more in a gray area because if you look at the bibliography, you're going to find different definitions for the same term. The definitions that I'm, the definition that I'm presenting to you today, guys, I took it out from uh, the American Energy Department and the American EPA. But as I said, if you look at the bibliography, you can find slightly different uh, concepts for the same term. So this lack of definition and consensus definitely inhibit the popularization of the concept within the industry because they feel like they're stepping in a foggy and gray area where they actually don't know where they're trying to, to go. The second problem here is the regulatory, which I mentioned um, in my presentation. So in many places, you are not allowed to treat wastewater on site if you have access to the city wastewater system. And you're also similarly, you're not... Uh, a, you're not allowed to treat water on site up to potable water standards. So you cannot drink the water that we're treating if you have access to the town water supply. So this can be a barrier. And for the, that example that I showed on the, the previous slide, this building here, the Bay Foundation in America, if I'm not mistaken, they had to, you know, try to some way overcome the regulatory barriers that they had in place because they were not initially allowed to do that, to treat all the water on site. So this can be something um, that definitely inhibit people to you know, take those projects along. And finally, the costs involved in doing a net zero water beauty. So for, as I said, the net zero is a concept that ideally, ideally you should be incorporating from the very beginning of the design stage of the building. 
this I said this because this is the most ex, uh, cheap. This is the cheapest way of doing that. For an existing building, for example, retrofitting it up to net zero water status can be very, very costly. It's almost unviable because you need to break, put down all the walls and redo all the pipeline. So you can imagine how expensive uh, this can be. And even for the new buildings, when you're designing that, you're going to need to incorporate systems that are normally not there, like, for example, wastewater and portable water treatments, or even the green infrastructure like a rain garden or a biosol that are used to treat the water that goes back to uh, the water table. So these systems are not necessarily expensive or not necessarily very technical and technological. So wastewater treatment, for example, is just a septic tank and they are not they, they, they have been out there for a long time and we know that how they work and operate, but it's just not common to include that in the buildings. And this is an industry where people have a very, uh, I would say, a very big inclination to the status quo. They are very resistant to new ideas. They like to do things the way they have been doing before. So including this kind of system that requires some type of maintenance and some type of you know, testing and sampling can be a barrier for um, the developers and builders and architects working on the project. And I believe this was my last slide. So I hope that you like my presentation and I you could make myself understand. I speak sometimes too fast when I'm presenting. I know that I'm trying to improve, but I hope you could get the mo most of it and happy to answer any of your questions, guys. Thank you.